The following program may contain coarse language, violence, nudity, mature subject matter, or scenes which may not be suitable for all viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And good evening, one and all, and welcome to another edition of the X Zone. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. If you would like to send me an email, xzone at xzoneradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And uh, tonight we're coming to you around the world on the Talkstar Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, Exxon Broadcast Network, and Channel 54 on Simul TV, which is the Exxon TV channel. Um, our first guest tonight was um, had to cancel because of the growing concerns of Hurricane Ian throughout Florida. So our thoughts and our prayers are with everybody in Florida, as well as our good friend Larry Lawson, who is the host of paranormal stakeout larry and his family live in vero beach so blessings to each and every one of you and i hope you're all safe and sound my first guest uh, this hour exo nation is tom hogan and uh, tom is a um he's an author and he was also a um well let's bring tom on and let's talk to him hey tom how are you good how about you rob i'm doing pretty good tom you went from silicon valley to writing the books you do, how, how did that, how did that happen? Well, you know, I had uh, a background that was not traditionally Silicon Valley to begin with. And that was, mm -hmm. you know, I got into the Valley uh, out of university teaching. I was a professor of Holocaust and genocide studies. So it wasn't like I was a computer geek who got into the Valley. I was someone with a humanities and a human rights background that got in and so I always figured that I would be leaving Silicon Valley when the time was right, you know, to pursue other avenues. I kept writing during the time that I was running marketing for companies like Oracle, et cetera. And then um, my wife wanted to uh, leave Silicon Valley. We'd been there 20 plus years and come back to University of Texas or to Austin to get involved in the political issues that are going on here in the state. And so that's what we did about five years ago. Um, why do you write about such grim topics though? I, you know, it, it's one of these bad jokes about you write what you know, and then people say, well, you know, well then you must've been abused as a child. <laughs> You're writing about pedophilia or, you know, et cetera. I, you know, my first novel was about, prisons and sexual violence, but I knew quite a bit about that, not because I'd been in jail, but because um, my wife was the head of the Rape Crisis Center when we first met. I mean, this was a fun couple. I was a Holocaust professor and she was a rape crisis counselor. So, you know, uh, you can what did you talk about on dates, you know? I was going to say, it wasn't the dates. It was that people were afraid to invite us to parties. <laughs> you know, uh, they say, you know, these are nice guys. Just don't ask them about work, you know. And um, so I, I knew what I was writing about secondhand based on my experiences living with here and hearing all of the war stories. The second novel, obviously, I knew about because of the, uh, the Holocaust. The interesting idea there for me, and it seems to have struck a chord with some of the readers and some of the film uh, um, the script writing contest that I've won is I put the Holocaust in the background rather than it be front and center with neon saying, isn't this awful? This is horrible. This is how people die. I thought no one had ever done a movie or a book where the Holocaust was just kind of there as another character as a or background and that we would use a familiar trope like, mm -hmm. you know, a detective thriller but set in Auschwitz. So you learn a lot about it without having it knocked over your head in a nonfiction manner. And then the same thing with pedophilia. I had been exposed to, that's probably the wrong phrase to use with the uh, uh, pedophilic priests, but I had been in Catholic seminary programs as a teacher and as a student. And then I'd lived in 
Protestant seminaries when I was doing graduate work. And it was fascinating to me to see the difference between the two traditions and then how it played out with sins like pedophilia. So and the other thing is writing humor is hard. Writing drama, not that tough. You know, if these guys who can write 300 pages of light stuff, God love them. I just find it easier to write about the tough stuff. Um, you and I were talking briefly before we went to air, and mm -hmm. I asked you why, why there are still people today who believe that the Holocaust was nothing else but a big hoax. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating thing. Those people have never gone away. You know, I started teaching the Holocaust, you know, 30 plus years ago. And yeah, the deniers were there, but they were so far out on the spectrum that you just think, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and now they're almost mainstream given that, you know, you've got so many conspiracy theories out there led by QAnon, but you know, you've got this receptive ground. I don't know if you saw the, the family, I think they were in Minnesota where the father just went crazy with the gun and shot his wife dead, shot the family dog, and uh, then shot one of his daughters who luckily lived. And it was all because they questioned QAnon and they said he'd been a great guy up until the, uh, you know, the uh, COVID hit and all of a mm -hmm. sudden he was uh, bunkered down. And when you bunker down, I think you're more receptive to things like the Holocaust myth. Why is that? You know, I think you you've got more time. You you wind up and you know, you wind up with the algorithms that you know Google and Facebook and whatever. You click on one thing of interest, and the next thing you know, you're getting eight different you know uh, uh, leads from far right or really mm -hmm. offline uh, ideas, and it's all because of that one time that you pressed one button, and all of a sudden, they just had yellow stickums that they were putting all over you saying this is a potential candidate for what you have to say on the, uh, on the far fringes. So I think that kind of bunker mentality and then, you know, having friends in the online world happens to be the way that it works. And it's, it's, you know, I'll be damned if I know it's what scares me is not so much people think it, but how much they're mm -hmm. invested in it emotionally. And sometimes even financially, they're spending days and, thousands of dollars to go to these conferences what for just to be with like-minded folks who say yeah i agree with you i it's a mystery to me rob why do you think the catholic the catholic church has been so tolerant of the amount of pedophilia that's been going on in the church that one i think is an easier one for me having been around it and that is that the number one rule of the church mm -hmm. is to stay alive. You know, uh, it's, it is not to do the right thing. It is not to do right by its parishioners, whether it is because it thinks it's God's will or because it's, they just figure what the hell else are we going to do if the church goes away? These guys, it's church first and foremost, and you can see it, um, you know, certainly when it comes to pedophilia, you know, the idea is, you know, if you really crack down on this, you're going to lose priests that you can't afford to lose if you're still trying to stay relevant in today's world. You know, churches will shut down for lack of pastors. I'm not defending at all, as you mm -hmm, and I, I understand know. that. But you see what I'm saying is the church will say, well, you know, and I write in the book, you know, that um, one of the one of the archbishop's cronies gets a little drunk and he says, hey, listen, we're already having to import priests from the Philippines. It used to be the Irish guys with the, the red nose from drinking. And now it's, you know, people in their 20s from uh, the Philippines to help keep the churches open. And so the guy says the archbishop or the cardinal believes that if diddling a few kids keeps us with the priests, it's a trade off we're willing to make. It sounds brutal, but I think that's the case. What people don't realize and... Uh... I'm sure you'll understand it. Is that a church is the church is a business, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it's a corporation. You've got the you've got the headquarters head head office of the Catholic Church in in at the Vatican. The CEO is the Pope, 
you've got the you've got the uh, what are they the cardinals that yeah, are the, the board like of the board directors of yeah and and then you've got the people who go to church hoping for a better life putting money into the in the collection pot they're the shareholders it's yeah. a business and i and, think uh, you and, know, uh, go ahead go ahead no no go ahead sir i was going to say and within that context i've written some articles where i said you know if you really want the church to take you seriously you vote with your feet you don't show and you vote with your wallet you don't yeah. show up for mass and you don't put anything in the collection box and those are the two languages that the church understands as you say you know it's a business and it if is, it starts and... to lose people and it starts mm -hmm. to lose money it'll take corrective action until then why should they you know the church is the is the richest corporation in the world mhm mm you know and, and it, it boggles my imagination why the church has been able to get so rich off off of the backs of the of the poor and the, the destitute poor. yeah no, you don't have to take go ahead no no go ahead Tom. i was going to say you know it would uh it would be such a uh a positive thing if the church just liquidated some of the vatican uh artwork that they have yeah. that's worth that's that's never going to see the light of day and institute a program like that for building its churches rather than on the backs of the uh, the local parishioners who can't afford it. I agree with you 100%. Tom, please stand by. Exonation, our guest this hour is Tom Hogan. His website is tom-hogan.com. And Tom and I will be back on the other side of the short break. Whatever you do, don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back. Tom Hogan is my special guest. His website is tom-hogan.com. Tom, do we really need the church in today's society with everything that's going on? That's a great question, Rob. And I think the answer is um, surprisingly, maybe for the first time in history, the answer may be no. Uh, it's, it's not just Catholicism, but you see now that for the first time, no identified religion is the number one identifier for this generation of, of young people. So if I'm any organized religion, but especially the Catholic Church, I've got to be worried about that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I agree with you what you were saying about liquidation, liquidating some of the assets in the Vatican. I think that the churches and the diocese around the world, well, in the, in the, in the rich parts of the world, such as Canada, the United States, and Great Britain, and so on, should liquidate their assets and give it to 
the cause that the really? religious philosophies were actually created for. And, you know, if, if you do believe in Jesus and, and the way the church was started, and if you do believe that he's looking down from above, he must be saying, what the hell did I do? Where did they go wrong? Yeah. You know, geez. Uh, do, do you see, do you see any, any, any changes being taken by the, by the church officials, especially the Vatican, when it comes to the way the church is operating and uh, with what they have been accused of, what they have been found guilty of, and what has yet to be discovered? Yeah, and the to be discovered is, I think, uh, it's it's out there in a big way. You and I were talking before the show mm -hmm. uh, that the, the Pope was in Canada apologizing for the actions against the indigenous tribes. Yes. Um, if you want, probably the best case study, as you were saying, is, is Catholicism still relevant today. Uh, you look at a, a country like Ireland, you cannot get more Catholic than Ireland, you know, historically. For example, when John Paul II went there and gave an open mass, and remember, he had very restrictive, he, uh, he charismatic guy, but restrictive church policies. He drew, you know, crowds of over a million people, one to two million people for his masses and his parades. Right. And then you get a guy like Pope Francis, who's a good guy. Um and trying to do some stuff, but in the interim, they've unearthed all of that information about the uh, pedophilia and about the church, uh, the schools for unwed mothers where they'd never see the light of day and die and be buried on the grounds. And the country just rose up against the Catholic church. And probably the number one example of that is that it, not the United States, it went the opposite direction from us and it, uh, uh, voted for abortion. And the idea that a Catholic nation would have turned its back on the church, the Pope, and mm -hmm. okayed abortion, that's got to send shivers down the spine of, you know, the Catholic hierarchy. Do you think that um, what we're seeing today in the world, you know, like you were saying in Ireland and other predominantly Catholic areas, is, is a sign of what's to come. And do you see the falling of the church and the Vatican in the future? Well, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, the, we see it um, in politics and mm -hmm. um, I, I just finished an interesting book about identity and um, you know, where we, where we get our sense of meaning and more and more it's from the tribes that we're in, rather than the religions we believe in. And they said that religion has suffered because the tribes are there, which, which are much purer. If you, if you want QAnon, you can find pure QAnon. If you want this or that, you can find that community online. You don't need to find meaning from an organized religion anymore. It's there in your computer. And so, yeah, I think, you know, um, the the whole idea of how people identify and what they're willing to put up with to keep that identity intact is the next real challenge for us as a society. I had a pastor on many years ago. His name was Pastor Harry Walther. And um, he said, we were talking about the Antichrist. And he said, you know, Rob, the mark of the beast is not 666. I said, what is a pastor? He said, it's WWW. Yeah. That's a good one. I like yeah. that. Um, do you think celibacy within the Catholic Church is one of the leading causes of pedophilia? I think without a doubt, you know, is um, when I'm talking to people, just kind of grounding them who don't know much about uh, Catholicism or the priests, mm -hmm. I said to them, I go, think about the cops. There's cops who join because they just love to serve. And then there's yeah. the bad bullies from high school who got the job because they like punching people around. Same thing with teaching, same thing with any service industry. You've got the great causes and you've got the washouts. Celibacy is one of those things that attracted uh, certain people to the church. They were awkward with women. They may be repressed homo homosexuals back in the 50s and 60s. And there was a place that said, it's OK, you don't need to like girls. In fact, we're going to say that you can't go with them, you know. And so it attracted 
just like the bully cop, it attracted Catholicism, always attracted the cause, central pastoral priests, and then it attracted the limited socially, you know, who were either repressed or uncomfortable. And then they'd put them in a seminary with no ex exposure to the outside world. Well, what the hell do you think is going to happen? Yeah. So I think celibacy is something that a lot of priests like because it gives them an excuse not to function in the real world, you know, the way Protestants and Jewish counterparts have to do. And it, it kind of reinforces their sense of isolation and say, it's not us, you know, it's the church that says we can't date or can't marry or can't have sex with members of the opposite sex. What about the nuns? Where do they fit in in all this? The, you know, there's two groups that... Uh, there's nuns and there's brothers, okay? And brothers I, are even weirder for me because they're they're like priests light, you know, like Coca-Cola light. Uh, <laughs> like, you know, you sit there and go, well, wait a minute. You have to give up all the same shit that the police, that the priests have to give up, but you don't get any of the benefits of being able to say, you know, mass or hear confession. And I'm sitting there going, you know, that's that's not exactly a career choice I would make. Uh, right. If I'm going to go that direction, I want to be a priest. It's the same way with the the nuns. Is I've met some wonderful nuns, but it's you know for people who want a life of service, that's great. But there's so many other ways that you can pursue it and still have a different life romantically, or you know. So it's a mystery to me because uh, they're wonderful. They have a real sense of service, but unfortunately they don't have any power within the church. None. It, it seems to me that the reason why the nuns are there to say, well, all right, listen, you know, we're not only a boys club, but we'll let a few odd members in. Right. And they'll let uh, the nuns hmm. do things like, you know, do the readings now and every now and again do a, a sermon, but, you know, but the good stuff is still, re, you know, um, uh, just restricted to the boys. I, for one, would love to be able to go into the the Vatican archives and see what is really there. You know, I, I think that everybody's taste was was tingled when Tom Hanks did the Da Vinci Code and yeah. and the, the other great movies that he's done. Do you think that these archives should be made public? And do you think that if they were, that it they would be part of the downfall of the Catholic Church? Well, I think um, I think the worst part about it is that this is nothing that's being shared with the rest of the world, you know, in a single room in the Vatican archives, from what I understand in terms of the, the, the value of the art within it, you know, could fund so many initiatives for the poor, could build so many, you know, church centers or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think you're right. If that was ever came to the you know light you'd see that we're not even talking billions we're somewhere beyond billions in terms of the worth of what exists in those archives and no one's seeing them except the archivists the catholic church and other churches seem to prey on the weak and they use their power of the pulpit as a method of control um you know if you do this and it's not right, you'll go to hell. If you do this and it's right, you'll go to heaven and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, to me, there's a little bit of brainwashing involved here. Oh, I think a lot. Um, you know, uh, to a large degree, um, I would say Judaism is the exception. But, mm -hmm. you know, um, most Christian churches do not want you thinking for yourself. They want to tell you, you know, uh, at, at least with the Protestants, they will encourage you to read scripture by yourself. Catholicism won't but, even do but, that, you know. But the Protestants read. don't want you to question what you read. No, exactly. I mean, you know, if you look at, at what's going on, the, what you were mm -hmm. talking about earlier, if anyone comes to any of the conservative religious uh, and says, hey, listen, our, our own approach to things is violating so many of Christ's, you know, uh, edicts or even the Ten Commandments or whatever. But especially as you were talking offline, you know, what do you do for the poor? 
Yeah. You know, Jesus is up there going, whoa, 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 what happened to give away all of your riches and follow me? Yeah. You know, um, so yeah, I think you absolutely, uh, the less you think and the less you question, the easier your path is through your religion. I agree with you 100%, Tom. Thanks very much for joining us. You and I will be back on the other side of this break. And explanation, if you'd like to contact Tom, his website is Tom hyphen hogan.com this is the excellent i'm rob mcconnell tom hogan is my special guest and we'll both be back on the other side of this break don't go away Welcome back, everyone. Tom Hogan is my guest. Yes. His website is tom-hogan.com. Tom, tell us a little bit about your, your book, The Empty Confessional. Well, you know, just as uh, I was uh, talking about using the Holocaust as backdrop rather than front and center right. um, for a thriller, uh, I did the same thing with uh, pedophilia. I have written articles um, for... Newsweek and other publications about why the Catholic Church attracts so many and tolerates so much pedophilia. And I thought, you know, the same thing is if I had a, um, a priest who becomes aware of what's going on and the depth of the pedophilia within his ranks and starts to take action against those people, mm -hmm. it would be an interesting kind of detective thriller. And so what the idea is that this guy's got his own problems, 27 years old, and he's already got his own church because of what you and I are talking about, the lack of other candidates he's in over his head. Uh, he's attracted to one of his parishioners, and he finds an outlet for that in violence, but it's, in his mind, justified violence. It's the rapists and the spousal abusers he discovers through the confessional, and then, as well, the pedophilic priests that he discovers on his own outside of his um, outside of the church. So the idea was to investigate this again, not in a nonfiction heavy handed, but you learn quite a bit about Catholicism and how it protects its priests, but in the context of a thriller rather than, you know, a heavy handed uh, philosophical tone. How long did it take you to write this book and uh, what kind of research did you do? It took me a couple of years. The research, you know, it's there. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you just have to, you know, pedophilia, Catholic priests, and then, you know, go get a cup of coffee. It's going to take that long to download. You know, it's, um, so it's there. But for me, what was more interesting was the time that I had spent with um, Catholic priests or priests, you know, wannabe seminarians, and then the mm -hmm. same experience um, in uh, Protestant seminaries. And what I mean by that is that what I remember from the Catholic experience was I was asked one time to interpret to a Protestant group how Catholicism and its ministry is uh, structured. And I said, you know, best way to think about it is, is, uh, is an hourglass. Up at the top, you have God, the church, all of the, the rulings and teachings, et cetera. 
And down at the bottom of the hourglass is all of the faithful. In the case of the Catholic Church, a billion people. And right in the middle, that pinch point is the priest. Is The priest is having to interpret God to the people and the people to God. That's a hell of a lot to ask of you know a young guy who's not really that equipped and not that well balanced to begin with, or he wouldn't be in a seminary. So, you know, um, that kind of, that kind of situation, it was less the research and more my personal knowledge, but it made, made sense to bring it into the book. Uh, just out of curiosity, have you ever heard of any uh, imams in any mosque in the and with Muslims or, uh, you know, the Islamic traditions or religions who have ever been uh, charged with pedophilia? Not not to my knowledge. No uh, they have some odd knowledge, you know, perspective about women, as we're seeing in Iran. But, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Same thing with Judaism, you know. Uh, and uh, but I don't know if you have seen the um, Southern Baptists have now come under the same kind of cloud. Uh, there was an independent audit done. Now, God bless them that the hierarchy felt they, I think they were surprised at what they discovered, but they, you know, allowed an independent audit of uh, the Southern Baptist hierarchy and found that it was rife uh, with pedophilia and other pretty egregious sins. So it's not all Catholicism, but Catholicism mm -hmm. certainly leads the pack. And you're right. Uh, Islam and Judaism I haven't heard of very much at all. It would definitely be corner cases rather than institutional. I I think that the media and the um, the access to information now 24/7 365 certainly is playing a big part. I remember the days when uh, Jim and Tammy Baker fell from grace, and then Jimmy yeah. Swigert fell from grace, and it, it you know it was like a domino effect, a and yet people still still give to these organizations it's like they've i i don't understand it to me it makes no sense if if i give to an organization that i find out that is corrupt is going against everything that i believe that they stood for i'd stop giving yeah but yet I, there are those people and i guess the same is for the catholic church and any other religious philosophy where there are crimes being committed against their people in this case the parishioners well, you know, uh, going back to my days uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember the whole scare about Y2K that, you know. Oh, when, I sure do. You know, and the planes were going to fall from the sky, et cetera. Yep. But what it reminded me of was, you know, all of these millennialist cults that say, you know, the world is going to end on September 27th, 2022, and everyone gets together in their you know, enclaves and waits for it. And then the next day happens and you sit there and you think, well, they must have disbanded by now. No, they double down. You know, either they don't want to feel stupid mm -hmm. or someone comes up with a way of saying, well, we, we, mis we misunderstood the signs. It's actually 2030. And now these guys have got another eight years of belonging that they feel good about. Do you think that the... Um present situation with the churches have a direct result in the increased number of cults in the Canada and the United States? Well, that's a tough one. Religiously, I don't see it. Um, mm -hmm. I certainly see it, though, politically. I don't know if you have the equivalent of, you know, the white supremacist enclaves. It used to be just sure. in, in um, Idaho, you know, it used to be Coeur d'Alene, Idaho was like ground central for white supremacy and racism in general. Um, but now it's there's there's all types of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho is all all over. I mean, you just have to see what's being discovered in the January 6th hearings in the U.S. And you realize that. Um, oh, boy. Yeah, exactly. This is an this was an armed uh yeah, you know, insurrection, you know, kind of closer to home for you. I don't know if you remember, but when the yeah. mob took over the Minnesota State House and, you know, they had guns and they eventually yeah. was revealed that they were going to try and kidnap, try and execute the governor. But I remember when that happened, most of us just saw that as, you know, almost like a bad frat boy event, you know, that had gone 
gone crazy. A few militia types happened to get past security. No, no, no. That was a well-organized and that was a precursor to what we see today. So, yeah, I think the there's a hole now that religion has created or seeded to the public. And you're right, Rob, I think it's whether it's political cults or ideological, that sense of belonging is coming from other areas than the word of God. It's going to be very interesting for us here in Canada to watch what happens in your midterm elections that are coming up. Yeah. Because whatever happens in the United States, especially when it comes to the interest rates and so on and so forth, affects us up here. So uh, as, as an American, what do you foresee as the result of the upcoming midterms? Well, you know, I, I have to it's kind of like they say, give a disclaimer. I, I work with two organizations uh, down here. Um, one is the Lincoln Project, which is, um, mm -hmm. was formed to A, protect democracy, and B, defeat Trumpism. And then the second group is the um, ACLU, the Civil Liberties Union. Um, and I do uh, creative work for them because I used to run an agency, and I've written a series of ads all targeted at those people who are ashamed to be Republicans, but don't know what they can do about it is that's the group that is the, that is going to save the United States. It's not progressives like me and it's not far right people like QAnon believers who can get enough people. It's rational people who are looking for a home and this 20, uh, 22 election is really going to set the tone for 2024. You know, are these people motivated by um, mm -hmm. abortion, for example? Uh, if so, that the right wing is going to have to retrench in terms of its policies. On the other hand, it may be that they're encouraged to double down based on what they see. And anyone who can tell you that they know what's going on in 2022, when all said and done, you know, don't believe them because I'm in the center of it with the experts and they don't know what's going on. You and I have to take our final break for this hour, Tom. Thanks so much for coming on. It's great talking to you. And uh, Tom and I will be back on the other side of the short break as the Exxon continues with yours truly, Rob McConnell from our broadcast center and studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to find out more about Tom, if you'd like to uh, see what he is all about, visit his website, tom-hogan.com. We'll be right back. Don't go away. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens and they kept repeating to me over and over again, Simultv.com, Simultv.com. What's Simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a Simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about Simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, Sonny Boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, Sonny Boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. SIMULTV.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about Simultv.com. SIMULTV.com. Welcome back, Tom Hogan and I are back here, and uh, this is the Exxon. Tom Hogan is my guest. His website is tom-hogan.com. Uh, tell me, Tom, do you see any parallels between the years leading up to the Holocaust and America today? You know, I do, and I've, I've always uh, hesitated ever since Trump became our president to do that. We uh, In the Holocaust business, we used to say there were two forbidden analogies. You couldn't use the Holocaust itself as an analogy, like people saying, 
abortion is the Holocaust of the unknown. Right. And you can never call someone else another Hitler, mm -hmm. you know, because Hitler was so unique and so, so evil. But people, when they're looking for parallels to what we're doing today, the first time before things got serious, before January 6th, people would say 1968, where you had the riots in the street over uh, Vietnam, civil rights, the assassinations of you know Kennedy, King. And then January 6th came and it became so much more serious than 1968. And the historians like John Meacham were saying their analogy was the United States in the two or three years leading up to the Civil War, 1857 to 1860. But in my mind, as, as you pointed out with your question, Rob, we're a lot closer to Germany in the, uh, in the late 20s and early 30s is that, you know, after they lost the war, you got to remember that there were never any foreign troops on German soil. They couldn't, the, the people weren't prepared to lose. And then the next thing you know, along comes this madman telling them that it's not their fault, it's the Jews' fault, et cetera. I think there's quite a few analogies. You look at the um, the Proud Boys and all of this, they're very much like the brown shirts that brought Hitler to power. Everyone thinks of the Gestapo. That was after he got to power. He got to power through street violence, intimidation. And we saw that in Michigan again, January 6th. And, um, you know, Hitler had the Reichstag burning that gave him the right to call martial law. And then you hear that Trump was trying to use the riot on January 6th as his right to call martial law and suspend the election. So the analogies, at least to my mind, are there. Wow. Let's just get away from politics and pedophilia for a few minutes here, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, one of your books that I, that I wanted to talk to you about was The Ultimate Startup Guide. Yeah. Um, I, I think that your book, your book's time is here now because I think after COVID-19, there's a lot of people who are looking for that, for that opportunity because the business they were in or the company that they work for, the restaurant that they work for just isn't there anymore. So tell us about your guide. Well, the guide came from the fact that, uh, my partner and I, uh, Carol Broadbent is my partner. She and I started an agency and she was, uh, the woman who was behind, all of the communications and marketing strategy for Sun Microsystems, which was a big deal for your non-technical audiences back in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. And I was doing the same thing at Oracle. Um, and the two of us came together and we used our um, combined marketing skills and knowledge and contacts to go into the venture capitalist community and work with their startups. And that's what we did for uh, since 2008 until we shuttered the agency last year. And we would go on in and we would be their acting VP of marketing or CMO for their first year. We'd help them learn marketing and sales because most of these people were technologists. They had a solution, but they had no idea how to build a company and sell it. Mm -hmm. And so we would go on in and help them. Then we'd, one, we'd hire our replacement and move on to the next startup. And that's what we did for, you know, the better part of 15 years. Is the market ripe today for startups and uh, entrepreneurs? I think it is because of what you said is, is so much of, of what happened. Um, I mean, look at Zoom. Uh, you, know, you know, all of a sudden it's become like Xerox or Kleenex, uh, you know, even if you're not using Zoom, you'll say, I'll Zoom you. And mm -hmm. why is that? Well, because the pandemic forced everyone to do remote uh, learning and remote work. So all of a sudden, you've got this world. Uh, I wouldn't want to be in commercial real estate, for example, because a lot of people aren't coming back to the office. So the pandemic uh, held things up and shook it. And we're just seeing what falls out now. The reason that you don't see more startups is the funding isn't there right now. The VCs that I know have all put a zipper on their wallet and just said, we're going to ride this thing out for a year or two before we start writing checks. So the self-funded startups 
yeah, they're doing great. The ones that need six or eight million, you know, because of labs and that, they're hurting. Before we say so long for tonight, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us. A great pleasure talking to you. Um, what are your final thoughts? What would you like to share with the Exxon Nation tonight? I think mostly, you know, um, you know, just to use your own definitions, not, not just, you know, when people say think for yourself, but it's kind of like playing poker before the game, before the cards are even dealt, know what you can and can't lose at, in that particular hand. I think it's the same thing with politics or ideologies is, you know, be your own identifier, be your own thinker. And then if you find people who agree with you and can advance that, associate with them, but don't let them establish the rules up front. You set the rules and then find the right place, the right home for yourself. Tom, tell our listeners where they can find out more about you. Give, give them your website and also where they can find your books. Okay, it's www.tom-hogan.com, and the books are available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Tom, I want to thank you so much for sharing your time with us here on the X Omen, and I look forward to the next time you and I meet here to have another great discussion. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Thanks a lot, Rob. Good night, sir. X Zone Nation. Our guest this hour was Tom Hogan. www.tom-hogan.com. I'll be back on the other side of this short break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center and studios in Crystal, in, no, not Crystal Beach anymore, St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to send me an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com. And for any of the past radio shows of the Exxon Radio Show, visit www.xzbn.net. Don't go away. We'll be back at the top of the hour. Music. 